Well, stand up. Well, you don't have to. Stand up or lay down. I don't care, whatever. Let's sing the song if you want to a couple of times, okay? Here we go. Ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving? That's what we are. We ought to thank Him, love and praise Him a little more today, a whole lot more tomorrow. Ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving? That's what we are. We ought to thank Him, love and praise Him a little more today, a whole lot more tomorrow. Now let me hear you sing it. Ain't God good. Louder. Undeserving. That's what we are. We ought to thank Him. Love and praise Him. A little more today. A whole lot more tomorrow. That wasn't bad. started clapping all right, well, let's go ahead and pray and let our pastor get up here tonight. Well, Lord, we just come to you tonight again uh, this week. We want to tell you that we love you. And I ask if you would tonight, Lord, one more time, would you bless our pastor, give him everything that he needs again to stand here and tell us the great things that uh, we need to hear, Lord, so we can help somebody else with this uh, wisdom that we're going to hear tonight. And then if you would, Lord, uh, we have a lot of folks, and you've already heard about some of them that's on our prayer list, and I pray right now that you just take them and Lift them up, Lord, give them the strength that they need and heal them, Lord. And then for those that are down and out, Lord, that you just lift them up and help them. And so we're going to thank you for that, too. But, Lord, most of all tonight, uh, we do want to tell you that we love you and ask if you would to forgive us because we fail you so many times each and every day. We don't want to, Lord, but we do. But, Lord, please help us. And then we're going to, uh, as we speak tonight, Lord, uh, we want to hear everything from you. And, uh Thank you. So we love you, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good <laughs> evening. Good evening. It's good to be back in God's house, all 13 of us. No, there's more than that. I was just... we, uh, One of the things that God's taught me a long time ago, it's kind of like the old boy that was a cattle feeder. He didn't know much about preaching, but he knew about visiting preacher that came and was uh, preaching and was only one person showed up in the me- in, in the service and so he asked him he said well one of us here what do you think I ought to do he said well if I don't put one cow come up come up when I go to feed I give that one cow a feeding so he got up and preached for about an hour and a half just as hard as he could farmer told him he got through he said preacher I, I, I do feed that one cow but I don't give him the whole load you know so, <laughs> I'll try not to give you the whole load at one time. How's that? Here we go. We're in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, we stopped in verse 19 uh, last Sunday evening. And we'll be in chapter 2 verse 20. Where Paul has been deagle, dealing with this thing of legalism. Legalism needs to be defined for you. I hope you understand what it means. True legalism teaches that you must keep certain elements of the law. In fact, true legalism says you must keep the whole law, plus have faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. That's true legalism. Uh, What we call New Testament legalism is when you add anything to grace, you negate grace and it becomes a salvation of works. And so we have a lot of that in America today where people say, well, yeah, I believe you need to believe in Jesus Christ plus this, 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 and this. Anytime you add anything to salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, through Jesus Christ alone, you are a legalist. Understand what I just said? Or you're practicing legalism or teaching legalism, whichever you might say. Now, we can readily say a Christian should do these things according to the Word of God. But not to be a Christian, but because you are a Christian. You understand the difference between those. And so when Paul deals with this issue, in verse 20 he says, He's been talking about this. In verse 20, he says, Wherefore, if you, and there's a big if, because listen to what it says. We all love to celebrate the resurrection of Christ and even our resurrection. 
uh, since we've come to know Christ. But we have to be dead first before there's a resurrection. And we don't like to think about that because that means that we need to be dead to self before there's a resurrection in our life in Jesus Christ. So he says, if, big if there, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments, and that's a big word, means elements, from the elements of the world, why? As though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Now, there's a parenthetical statement in here. I'm going to skip over it and read, read straight through, and then I'll back up and read the parenthetical part. Let's read this again then. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances, and if you would go down the middle of verse 22, after the commandments and doctrines of men. So here's what he says. He says, why would you let men take their ordinances and, 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 their, uh, and their traditions and, call, and infringe that upon you? And he, then he lists some of them in that parenthetical statement. He said, such as, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are to perish with the using. And, of course, that's what the legalist said. Of course, the law said that a, uh, uh, even a, a, a Jew uh, should never even touch a dead thing, especially a dead person. And that's part of the law. And uh, he said also uh, certain things that you could not eat because of the Jewish dietary law. And by the way, I'm convinced that the Jewish dietary law is probably the, the best diet in the world and the most healthy. If you go back to the Old Testament and read it, uh, I just happen to like pork chops too good to, to follow it very well. So, um, and I like catfish too, so I'm in real trouble, okay? But I still believe that, and, I, and God gave uh, the Israelites that dietary law in order to continue their line until the Messiah comes. So, and then he says... Verse 23, if you do such of that, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship. That literally means you, you take your will and you infringe it upon, uh, you put it under the conditions that are set before you, such as don't touch this, don't, don't eat this, don't drink that. And so it's a show of will worship, showing that you have the willpower. In essence, what that does is it edifies the person. Oh, I don't drink coffee, and I don't drink tea, and then I make me wonder why you live. And uh, but nevertheless, certain people have these things, you know, and they they don't they say, well, I don't do this and I don't do that, and it's what they're doing, what they're really doing. And by the way, it doesn't mean that some people aren't sincere in in their belief. They do it because they believe it's the right thing to do. But many times, it has to do with pride and has to do with I don't do this and I don't do that. And uh, it's like that old, that old saying, you know, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't run around with them folks that do. You know, yeah, but there's a whole lot of other things you don't do or should do that you don't do. Amen? So if we go to making a list, we can get into a whole lot of trouble. And that's what he's talking about. He says, this has a show of, of, of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So he says, the only good that will worship actually does it shows that you won't satisfy your flesh in certain areas. But, of course, you satisfy it in others. And here's how you satisfy the flesh many times is by being prideful about what you don't do. And it's amazing how people can do that. Well, you know, I don't do this, so, I, you know, I'm better than they are. They, they do this and they do that. Well, I had enough of that to get over when I, when I first got saved. I, got, I was in, in, got into legalism strong, and some of you others have been in the same place. And, you know... I've even preached against chewing gum, you know, especially in church. And I don't know that I wasn't pretty well straight. I just couldn't find a verse to fit it. And, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, Paul says doing that is nothing to just satisfying the flesh. And then in verse chapter 3, verse 1, he gets back to another if you. Remember, in verse 20 of chapter 2, he said, if you be dead. And then here in verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 1, he says, if you then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above. This has always been a, uh, a fascinating verse to me because the first time I read it, I read it this way. You may have. When, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are from above. If you put that word from in there, it makes a lot of sense because I'm seeking what God sends to me from above. You understand what that means? But that's not what it says. It says seek those things which are above now what things are above uh, the things of god 
you understand, I'm not talking about the things that God gives us. I'm talking about the things that He is. He represents holiness. He represents glory. He represents all the things that heaven. And so the things that he's talking about, because he just told us if you've been dead uh, from the rudiments of the world, then you've risen, then seek those things which are above. And then he said, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So then he gets specific. You need to seek the Lord himself. You know, I found out something in church. I believe there's a lot of people in church that love God. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that? I also believe there are a lot of people in church that are not in love with him. You understand the difference between that? Sure you do. Uh, here's, I've even had people say, well, I, uh, oh, I love him or her, but I'm not in love with him. Well, you, that's exactly what that means is there's, there's no passion about my relationship with him or her. So I'm, I'm ready to get out of the marriage. So uh, that's similar to what I believe is happening. And he's trying to say, here, seek him. Not the things he does, not the things that, that he is, but him himself. Seek Christ above. And then verse 2 explains it even more. He says, set your affection. And the word affection really, literally means your mind. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, that's not very hard to determine, d- determine what he means by that. What's here and what's there are two different items, right? And the things that we have a tendency to do, and this is a human part of us, we have, and by the way, I'm going to get to some verses that really ripped me up today. I don't know, I, I don't know what they're going to do with you, but I'm, I'll tell you what they did with me when we get to them. And uh, he says that we're, our affections ought to be on the things above and not on the things here. Um, and he makes it a little bit more plain. He says, for you are what? Wow. He said earlier, if you are, and then he comes back here, and he's speaking to us as though we have already proclaimed, and the headstone is already in place. Spiritually speaking, we are dead. Our affections for the earth, that's what he's talking about. Our affections for the things of the earth are dead. But our affections now, here's what happens. If you divide your affections 50% on the earth and 50% in heaven, guess what? You, both, both of them get about the same thing. But if you take all of your affections and put them in either place, guess what? You can be a whole lot more affectionate about wherever all your affections are. And this is what he's trying to tell us. So he says, and says, for you are dead and your life is hid. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Uh, here, here's what it literally means. Your affections now should be Christ-like. Because your life is hid inside of Him. Mm. Uh, does that challenge you a little bit? Challenge me a whole lot. I, I, uh, I, I'm often, you know, I'd be, I, I could be a good Christian if I didn't have to read this book. But it has a tendency to get right up next to me. And he said in verse 4, he says, Now, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Now, I love that verse out of all of the ones that we're going to deal with tonight. That's my favorite. You know why? He says, you are dead and you've got to be if you're going to reside with him in glory. Understand what he just said? And he says, you're, you're dead. Your life is hid with God in Christ. And when he shall appear, then you shall also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, here we go. You got your seatbelts on? Mortify. You know what that word means? It means to treat as if dead. It's where we get our word mortician. To... Treat, it says, mortify, therefore your members, talking about of your bodies, our bodies, which are on the earth. Treat them as if they have no right to live. Is that uh, Let's go ahead and let the Word do the explanation for you. Okay, here it goes. He says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And then he starts listing some things. 
fornication, which is an act of sexual impurity of any kind. It can be adultery. It could be um, any kind of illicit sex act. At uncleanliness, which has to do with impurity. And that can be in thinking and in action. You know, Jesus said about the, about the, uh, the situation of, of looking on a woman to lust after her in your heart, that, that the thinking process can be impure. And, uh, and by the way, the thinking process is almost always impure before the actions occur. And then he says, inordinate affections, and that means actually lustful compassion. And that simply a sense of um, placed in the wrong direction, inordinate affection. And then he says, evil concupience, which is to lust after. You always talk about all these things that, that normal human beings do. The only thing, we're not normal human beings anymore. Amen? We've been, somebody amen out there. We, we are, we've been born from above. We have a brand new life. We, we have, and you say, well, wait a minute. You know, I'm still human. Uh, we, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that because you expressed it just then. But the point being, we need to understand that our life is hid with God in Christ. You need to understand that. And he says, coviousness. Now, this is where he got me. Coviousness. Now, look at that next Two words, which are three words, which is what? You know how serious idolatry is? Idolatry means image worship. Now hold on a minute. I want to deal with something, hopefully, to help you if I can, because it helped me when I begin to look through this word, looking back at it. It's the word play. On exakia, that's the Greek word. Let me break it down for you, which what I just said means nothing except unless you break it down. And the word play comes, comes from the idea of more. And then the word exakia comes from the phrase to have. So in the Greek, you rip it backwards and it means to have more. So the desire to have more. It's covetousness. It also means greediness for gain. Um, is anybody sitting in here that doesn't desire to have more or haven't desired to have more? I want to see if there's anybody in here that's... No, I don't need... That's a dumb question, right? Uh, well, <laughs> well, then we're a bunch of dummies. Because here's what happens... According to what he's saying in here, it, it took me a while to get through this. And I'll be honest with you. I had to get before God and say, God, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And I absolutely do not want to be an idolater. But wait a minute. I went back and I got to looking at this thing because it really bothered me. It bothered me because of my situation. And I got to looking at this thing about uncleanliness, uh, fornication, inordinate affection, evil concupience, and coviousness, and lumped all together. I was trying to figure out, okay, what does this really mean? And I realized, those are the things that I would desire to have because that's what I want. So, idolatry in every sense is one of the two things for a Christian. Image worship, and guess what or who the image is? Self-worship. When all of a sudden we want what we want. We want this, we want that. And all of a sudden I begin to realize I had no intent, God, to worship myself. But I found myself doing that. Because I, there, I'm being totally honest. I never truly understood that whole statement. And yet I know that covetousness, not to covet, is one of the Ten Commandments. You know that. I know that. And here Paul elaborates on it. And he goes to verse 6 and he said, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, he's talking about 
pagans here. He's not talking about his children there. Because the children of disobedience are those who have denied a relationship with God. In fact, the word itself, literally the phrase, means paganistic. And verse 7, he said, In the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. So what he's just done is he says, The things I've listed here as being idolatry are normally practiced by unbelievers. Not believers. Unbelievers. Ooh. And so he said in verse 8, But now you also put off all these, plus... Anger. Do I need to stop there or just? Whew. Well, I'm sure glad somebody else is grunting besides me. Anger. Wrath. Malice. Blasphemy. By the word, it's the same word. By the way, it's the same word that's used in the one sin that's unforgivable but it's not talking about the unforgivable sin here it has to do with that that you've already put away filthy communications out of your mouth put off all that stuff anger malice wrath um, I, and i'll have to be honest there's some things that gets next to me that I, you know why I get angry at certain things? It took me a while to figure this out. I don't know that I totally got it figured out. It's because it upsets me. Now, there are those that will say, well, you know, Jesus got mad too. If you read through that scripture, it literally means righteous indignation. He wasn't angry about what they were doing to him. He was upset by the way they were treating the house and the things of God. That's called righteous indignation. Anger. If my anger has to do with self, guess what? I'm in trouble. Wouldn't you hurry up and believe? Come on with me. I told you, this is not... Won't y'all be glad when I get through with that? I'll be glad when I get through with that. But it's... Folks, we can look through this and act like it doesn't matter. We will face God for these things. And I know that. I know I will. Unless I choose to bend my will to His. And that's, that's where the... See, I don't believe that. I'm going to do it my way. You can do that. But there's a payday one day. And I don't want to do that. Amen? I don't know about you. I do not want to have to stand before God. And, uh, and by the way, if this book isn't literal, it isn't, doesn't mean anything. Just throw it away and do whatever you're going to do anyway. And he says, don't lie to each other. We ran into a situation today. You know what? Let me, let me say something. If you're going to lie as a Christian, you better get a lot of enjoyment out of it because there's a big payday for liars. According to the Bible, there is. And let me say another thing quickly. As, as, as a pastor of a church... And if you're a part of the fellowship of the church, you represent Jesus Christ and this church. And this church is nothing except who it belongs to. You understand what I'm saying? And if you misrepresent Jesus Christ and this church, I promise you there is, there, there's not, <laughs> that's, that's, not a, that's not a light thing. You understand what I'm trying to say? Um, I can promise you, I, I remember well, having a deceitful people, if, if I know someone's doing something wrong and, and bringing shame on this truck, on the church, on the body of Christ, not because we're anything, but he is somebody. And if they're bringing shame on him, I'm going to them and asking them to do one of the two things, either repent or find another church. Now, I'm not being ugly. But I believe that the people of God ought to be accountable to God himself. And this thing is a, this thing about lying, your testimony isn't worth the time it takes to get out of your mouth. Amen? And he said, don't lie to each other, seeing that you have... Now, here's what he's saying. Put off the old man with his deeds, but have we? I got there and I thought, have we? You know, he said, if you have, if you've been dead, seek those things which are above. 
And I, I just wonder if we, are, we want to be about half dead. Is there any such thing? That's, that's being about ha- like being half pregnant, right? You either are or you aren't. So if we are not, then we need to get that way. Because that's what he expects. And he goes on and he says, you have, you have put on the new man, verse 10, which is renewed in knowledge, and that's, that's revelation knowledge, that's the, the Greek word epinosis, and you're renewed in knowledge, listen to this, after the image of him that created him. So we're to be renewed in the image. Uh, I made this statement one time, and I, I never will forget, someone came up to me after the service. I said, you know, God really expects us to live like Jesus lived. Someone came out and says, I just need to let you know, preacher, I'm not Jesus and you're not either. I said, you've got that right, but that doesn't relieve me of the responsibility of living like he did. Amen. Amen. So, he says, when we're created in that image, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian or or Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all in all. So, he takes away all this separation of, of, of... Social uh, tears, and uh, I remember and when I was studying uh, sociology, they were talking about, you know, the tear plan. You know, you've got various different segments, and I thought, man, the church is that way. You know, big eyes and little U's. Now, let me say something to you very, very carefully. The only person in this room that can get in trouble with God about who they think they are is the one that thinks they are better than somebody else. You say, well, I live better than they do. No, you just think you live better than you do. they do, or else you wouldn't feel that way. I know that the grace of God is the only thing that keeps us going. Amen? Don't you know that? And he says, but we're to put on, verse 12, as the elect of God. That's who we are. We're the ones that God chose. He set His love on us. And drew us to Himself by His Spirit, immersed us into the body of Christ with nothing on our part to show any value of or any goodness for. It was totally by His grace, by His mercy, and He should get the glory for our lives being dead to sin and alive unto Him. He should get the glory for that. And He said, put on as the elect of God, listen to this, holy and beloved bowels of mercy you know what mercy is mercy is not giving people what they really would deserve or there's time that that one gets tough for me i don't know about you and then he said also kindness <laughs> where did that go out the door humbleness of mind get over yourself not thinking you're more than or better than anything else or anyone else Meekness, long-suffering, this next word, forbearing, it means putting up with love. Not just putting up with, putting up with love one another and forgiving one another. And if any man have a complaint or a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all things, Put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God. By the way, folks, if you're trying to be or I'm trying to be half dead, there's no peace there. Most of us have the idea that we still have the right to our own opinion. Not according to the Word of God. The thing that we have the right to do is to obey what He says. Would you say amen for me? And He said, and let the peace of God rule. And that word rule means to be the referee in your hearts. To the which also you are called in one body. And be what? I'll tell you what. Chapter 3 was very declarative in my life. 
today and yesterday when I was studying through this. Um, I think back through all the scriptures of where the Word of God talks about um, peace, contentment. And, and I really think that 21st century Christianity is probably is not what we think is peace and contentment is momentary satisfaction of some sort. And peace and contentment comes from a right relationship with God. By the way, you can't buy peace and contentment. You can't earn it. You can't work it up. The only way it can happen. And he said, the end results of having put off and put on. By the way, he puts on and we put off. So then the peace of God can rule in our hearts to the which you're called in one body and be thankful.